and welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's video is part of a series I do where I compare books with their movie adaptation. And before we get into the book and movie, I want to warn you that there will be spoilers for both, both the book and the movie. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, you should do that first and then come back and watch this video. I also want to tell you that this is available as a podcast. I will link to Spotify and Apple down below because those are the two most popular platforms, but I am on other platforms as well. So these tend to be about 30 minutes, but especially if they're longer and it works better for you to listen to it, that is available. And I also want to say that even though my podcast is called Why the Book Wins, <laughs> I do love movies as well. And there are times where the movie wins when comparing book first movie. So it is not always the book because I do love movies. And oftentimes, you know, before I even started this podcast, the reason I would read a book was because I liked the movie. And so I wanted to read the book for it. And so I love both essentially. And I think I give a fair, you know, view of both book and movie, despite my name being why the book wins. <laughs> anyway, thank you for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy it. And yeah, let's get right into the book first movie. Hi, welcome back to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's episode is very exciting. Not only are we talking about Stephen King, who is always a crowd pleaser, but I also have two guests on the show, Luke Elliott and James Bailey from the Ink to Film podcast. So welcome you guys to the show. Hello. Hi, thanks for having us. So Ink to Film is a podcast that compares books with their movie adaptations and Luke is a writer and James works in film. So you could not like it's the dream team for a book first movie podcast. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of their show. So you guys should definitely check them out. And they have covered a lot of Stephen King, including, you know, some of his big ones, like literally big ones it in the stand. And you've done The Shining, you've done Dr. Sleep, Pet Cemetery. Yeah, I think that's all of them. A lot. Yeah, so many. The Outsider. Oh, The Outsider. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's the other one. And then now Secret Window. So if you guys want to tell us about your podcast. Sure. Yeah, we've been going for, gosh, what, almost five years now? Yeah. Um, over 200 episodes. And we, we like to do a deep dive into the book and then move into the film. Try and give both mediums their due. And uh, yeah, Stephen King's been a longtime staple of ours. He was our first project ever. We did It uh, back in 2017 when we started out. And um, we continue to like, we like to touch in with uh, Stephen King at least once a year, I think at this point and uh yeah he's always a lot of fun he's a fairly important author to me yeah he, uh, i'm excited to talk about this one because it's it's kind of different than the other ones we've covered yeah we also have there's no shortage of adaptations being made so with us being an adaptation podcast uh king is always going to be relevant and then yeah he's like you said he's a crowd pleaser i really enjoy his work so i've had i've had a lot of fun with it yeah and i started listening to you guys over a year ago now and last year I listened to a number of podcasts, but last year, you guys, if I recall, were the number one <laughs> most wow. listened to podcast for me. So, oh, wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So Thank I you. definitely binged a lot of episodes because, yeah, you guys have been doing this for so long now. And so I love how insightful you are. And again, because you guys have the personal experience of being in the business. So I feel like you have a very unique take on things. Whereas I like I'm just someone who's a fan of books and movies. So I feel like I don't always have the insight. <laughs> But no, yeah, I mean, so your podcasts are always so good. That's a super valuable uh, perspective to have as well, honestly. You know, and it, that's something I always try and remember when we're doing our stuff is like we can kind of talk shop, but we got to remember that not everybody who works in these industries um, knows what the hell we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to like sometimes like slow down and explain and, and try and connect with people who are just readers because we love readers. We love, you know, film fans and we want to make sure that they're the ones ultimately who are enjoying this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and obviously like industry people can really, I don't know how much, how profane you want me to get, but can get the, up their own ass about things sometimes. <laughs> and I think, I think one you're talking about like, Oh, the craft and this is, this film is so amazing. If the general population isn't responding to it, then you're really like narrowing down your niche of uh, target audience demographic. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's great to have all pers perspectives on these works. And also, real quick, I want to do a shout out to an episode that I was on for you guys, for your podcast. Right. So this is May. So in April, I was on for an episode for Joyce Carol Oates, where we covered her short story and then the movie adaptation Smooth Talk with Laura Dern. So those listening or watching, I recommend you check that one out. And then, yeah, I'm a big fan of their podcast, so you can listen to any of their episodes. I recommend them all. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, they're, we consider them evergreen. We try not to do too much yeah. that, that ties them to a particular time period so you can... You can go back through our back catalog. Um, and yes, that episode you were on, I thought turned out really, really excellent. Um, we've gotten some good responses for it already. 
Nice. And uh, yeah, it's it's a cool one. You know, it's not a super well known movie, but a lot of people know know Joyce Carol Oates, and it was fun talking about her. And we got to get into some heavy topics, but I think it was a really mm. good discussion. Yeah, yeah, I actually listened to it this morning, and I enjoyed listening back to it. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> the book Secret Window, Secret Garden by Stephen King, published in 1990 from the Story Collection for Past Midnight, and then the movie Secret Window, directed by David Kep, released in 2004. I'm excited to talk about this project too, though, because like we went, King really is like our bread and butter, I feel like. Mm. And getting to read Stephen King, I was like, that familiar, that familiar prose was yeah. was there and, and getting. You know, like, you're reading it immediately. <laughs> right away. And we're, I mean, like talking about Maine and authors and all the, and oh. I'm like, okay, we're reading Stephen King. Yeah. Yeah. I've read, I don't know, probably less than 10 Stephen King books, but. I already consider myself a fan because I haven't read any of thing of his that I've disliked. And yeah, I really enjoyed this one. And so I'm just going to do a quick summary for those who maybe are listening but don't know the story. So we have Mort Rainey, who is a writer who is recently divorced. And so his wife is staying at their house in the city and he is staying up at their lake cabin in this lakeside town. And he's visited from a man named John Shooter, who claims that Mort has plagiarized his story that he had written prior. So Shooter is very threatening and he's threatening Mort's life and the lives of Mort's friends. And meanwhile, Mort's personal life also continues to get messier with his wife and her new guy who she was cheating on him with. And then their house burns down while he's dealing with Shooter. And then things with Shooter continue to escalate when he kills two men. But before long, so there's a twist to the story. And then the big twist is that we find out that Shooter is Mort and Mort is Shooter. And then from there, I'm not going to talk about the endings because the book and movie ending differ. So but that's the basic premise of the whole story and what the big reveal is. And so I was curious with you guys reading this story, because you said you had watched the movie. Like, did you clearly remember? And did you remember this twist going into the story? I did. I don't know about you, James, but I did remember the twist. I did not remember the twist. Oh, good. Uh, I'm glad that one of us didn't. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it had been long enough to where I definitely didn't remember. But there is another, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm just going to say there's another television show that's coming out currently that's dealing with a lot of the same kind of ideas and uh it's pretty popular uh people i feel like people who are watching it will know what i'm talking about but i don't just in case because it's not revealed until a couple episodes in so it was bringing the idea of this other show that i'm currently watching in with uh you know a character who is fractured in that way Mm -hmm. okay and at one point when you were reading the story like did you start to guess that shooter wasn't a real person or did were you buying it the whole time Oh, I, I, I think I picked up pretty quickly. Like once there were some there were some pretty heavy hints and uh, eventually I started to realize that, OK, so there's something inconsistent here. I'm trying to remember exactly where it was because I know where it was in the movie, but in the book. Um, did you read I'm the book to... before you watched the movie this time? Yeah. yeah OK. Did, did you not? Did you watch the movie? No, no, first? I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I did. <laughs> but I already remembered the twist. So yeah. I was yeah. trying to figure out when you first experienced the twist. Basically. Yeah, it was in the book. And uh it, I remember thinking that first of all, the entire time I'm I'm imagining Johnny Depp as this character. Yeah, <laughs> I just couldn't get his his like mannerisms really? out of my mind. See, I was just I was just picturing Stephen King through the, for the whole thing, even though I remembered the movie. <laughs> but like reading the book, it was such a King self insert. Like yeah. all the details were basically Stephen King's life. Well, like, what's the name of his like pen name too? That he. Richard Bachman, yeah. Richard Bachman, so he's clearly commenting on, like, what if my personality split with Bachman and King and, you know. Yeah. I loved all that, like, self-insert author stuff. You know, it it speaks to me as someone who writes all Mm -hmm. the time and and considers myself an author. Like, obviously not on the level of Stephen King, but, like, his life and talking about literary agents and the the ins and outs of publication and how it works and, like, all that stuff. um, uh, It's a little dated uh, for today because everything's moved online, but, like totally like it, that's my life like i deal with this kind of stuff all the time <laughs> and uh super interesting and uh I, I thought it was really cool how he was able to like make all these meta commentaries about the life of an author having all these characters in your mind having to kind of put on a persona and all of that and how it can uh sort of play out in the mind of someone who maybe feels a little bit unhinged um and we know that uh, back in this time period king was you know, going through a lot with substance abuse and stuff like that. And he had family problems. And um, I think he was drawing on a lot of that here. uh, And it seemed like, but also like having a lot of fun with it. Like I always felt like he was having fun. Yeah. And then talking about plagiarism, which for a writer would be like your worst nightmare, right? Yeah. 
yeah, it was it was kind of it was uncomfortable, honestly. Like that uh, when we finally got the reveal mm-hmm. in the uh, in the in the novel uh, yeah. about how this plagiarism actually happened and how he took like a student's yeah. a fellow student's story and published it under his own name. Mm-hmm. And that was like one of the first stories he ever had published, I think. And just the idea of like building your your career off of this lie, lie. as a foundation. Yeah. It's like, oh man, yeah, that would that would break your brain, I think, uh, over time, the guilt of that. And then Luke, since you already knew the reveal, did you like were you still on the edge of your seat as you read this? I you know, so so in general I really like the novella. Um I it is still it might be my least favorite King book I've read. And I haven't read much more than we've covered on the podcast, I don't think. Maybe maybe one or two more. But it's still on the low end of the ones I've read just because the the twist is a little parlor tricky. It's a little uh, expected to. At a certain point, you kind of see it coming. But what King does really well is he lampshades it. And I think there's even a line. I, I unfortunately didn't write it down. But he says something to the effect of, a real, you know, you know, you know, you're not in the hands of a good author or something when when they're telling a story and you can see the ending coming, yet you still want to get there. And I thought mm-hmm. that was him lampshading, like, yeah, I know most of you readers have probably seen where I'm going with this, but come along and it'll be fun along the way. And I was like, okay, I like that he's aware of that. Like he knows that, like, yeah, a lot of savvy readers are going to guess what's going on here, but I'm still going to write this book very seriously, have fun, but like. He writes the hell out of the book. He he, he puts yeah. all of his power into it. That's what I, I give him so many props for. It's like kind of a silly premise, yet he's gonna he's gonna take it seriously and and write it write it well. Yeah, and, and I do like how King incorporates other things from his stories. For in, for instance, their houses in Derry, and then mm-hmm. also Amy seems to have a bit of the shine because she has this yeah. intuition. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was thinking about yeah. that a lot, especially the movie. The movie reiter- reiterated that for me as well. Something else interesting to note is like. I think a lot of King fans will even admit that like he has an interesting relationship with endings and Mm -hmm. because I think you know some of the times he doesn't land it perfectly and like that the premise is so much stronger than the ending and in this case like like Luke said to lampshade that and to be like this is a situation where the ending might not be as satisfying as you think because halfway through you figure it out but but like you said (laughs) playing out going through the motions of, of going through the story I think I think was still enjoyable and and i and maybe it's because i i didn't remember the reveal but the it was really propelling as a story like it took me pulled me through it really quickly it was also very brief so that helps which yeah. is which is not for king yeah right. which like is not 50,000 words or so king. which is like a short novel for most people but is basically a short story for stephen king yeah. right <laughs> he probably wrote it in an afternoon <laughs> So the only thing I remembered was the reveal that he was shooter. Everything else I didn't really remember. And so I really enjoyed the book, though, and especially the second half. I think I just had a hard time putting it down, partly because I kept waiting for Mort to realize that he was shooter. But it happens like really close to the end. But in some ways that made me knowing the twist made me more interested because I was wanting him to hurry and figure it out. I love that he gets you so invested in the is it or isn't it shooter story. Even though, like, you start to realize that it doesn't matter, you're still, like, waiting for him to show the magazine to him and you want to have this confrontation. It Mm -hmm. doesn't quite play out the way you want it to, of course, but I I found that I was, like, invested. And I'm like, when's the magazine going to get here? I want him to show it to him and have this argument. Um, Even though I knew it didn't really matter, it just, I I still (laughs) cared about it. And then to move on to the movie. So this movie was released a year ahead of schedule because of... Depp's success with Pirates of the Caribbean, so they wanted to ride on that success. That's awesome. And <laughs> I did not know that. That's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like, like he became a mega star for that movie. I mean, he was already yeah. very popular. It feels like he was riding his charisma in this movie a lot. Yeah. And Pirates of the Caribbean is the movie that got me into Johnny Depp. And at that time, like, yeah. I kind of became obsessed with him. And so I saw Secret Window when it came out on DVD. But I don't think I had seen it since then. But the twist obviously had an impact on me because all these years later, I still remembered it. And then it's directed by David Kep. And I wanted to mention, a f- he's like more of a writer than a director, but I wanted to just mention a few stuff he's worked on, such as Jurassic Park, Jurassic Park, The Lost World, Death Becomes Her, which is kind of a, I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a fun one. Uh, and then Mission Impossible and the 2002 Spider-Man movie, which there is a scene we'll get to that definitely reminded me of Spider-Man, but I'll mention that later. As far as the movie, I wanted to mention like some shots that I thought were cool. Like in the beginning, you have the camera that's just like following you through up into the cabin and then 
takes you through the house and then it takes you through the mirror through the mirror such a cool yeah. effect i yeah, i, I honestly that. like i watched it back because I, I wanted to figure out how they pulled it off and it's kind of magical i i it's got to be cg because those those types of shots are so hard to match up and maybe they did pull it off because you can see I, I like went frame by frame and you can see where it goes from the mirror to the actual shot but impressive and after a huge move too right like after a huge mm -hmm. like coming through the house going down the looking down from the loft area to where he's sleeping and then towards the mirror what an incredible move that was awesome right away yeah and i also loved the score for this too i thought it really set the mood but also another scene i wanted to mention here is when Mort is having a nightmare and he's on his couch and he looks down and it's, it's the ocean below him and he starts to fall and then he falls on the floor instead. That seemed very like Alfred Hitchcock to me. Like if you guys have seen North by Northwest, mm -hmm. the scene at yeah. the end, like that's what it made me think of. And even the music in that moment, I don't know if it was on right. purpose or if it was G me just inserting my own memories, but I thought it was very Hitchcock-esque. Did you read that? There was a note about that I, I saw when I, I didn't do a lot of research for this uh, movie, but I did see something about that scene. Um, oh, th the B-roll? Yeah, apparently it's yeah. B-roll from The Lost World, uh, yeah. like at the beach scene. It was just something he had left over from filming The Lost World, and he just so put he just it in So he just tossed it in here. <laughs> well, so Spielberg directed The Lost World, so he would have been the writer. So I guess he went mm -hmm. to Spielberg as a favor then, huh? Well, yeah, I think they co-wrote, right, or something. Like, I, I don't know. I'm sure they did, but but like is, in yeah. order to get the footage, he would have had to get Spielberg. Yeah. I mean, they're probably, probably friends, so he probably yeah. was like, "Hey, can I use this?" And I'm sure Spielberg was fine with it. <laughs> what was so? I wanted to get your guys' take. What was that scene? Was that just like you said, maybe a Hitchcock reference, or or like was that something interpreted from the book? Because it felt like it was wholly new. No. Nah. Yeah, I don't think it was from the book at all. Not yeah, in the book. it just felt like it was a random scene put in there it was cool yeah you know I, yeah. I, I, yeah uh and then to talk about johnny depp which we already mentioned a little bit but i was kind of surprised i hadn't remembered how many comedic moments are in this specifically yeah. with just johnny depp and his mannerisms like we have the scene where he is like jumping ahead he is looking at the stuff that was burned and this is from the book where he and his wife are looking at the list of items that were burned in the house and then ted starts to look in and he gets upset but then the movie adds the scene where he's like getting upset and calling Ted a rubbernecker and... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, excuse me. Do you actually intend to rubberneck? I hardly think my concern could be construed as rubberneck. Amy, he's rubbernecking. Okay. I'm not going to freak out about this, but I... What the hell's the point? Okay. This is our stuff. I'm just trying okay. to be helpful. No, no, it's no, ours to understand right, why right, we're right, here. This is our no, stuff. No, he's right. He's right, Ted. Uh, would it help matters if I uh, took a walk around the block? Yes, thanks. Sure. Rubbernecker? Yeah, That's seems like funny. that. Um... <laughs> This is the way that there's the like uh, you postal cashier character mm -hmm. that he like mm -hmm. sort of has like a weird vibe with. And then at the end of the movie, the way that he he does like he goes full Johnny Depp in like this mm -hmm. weird because he gets to do the, the twist, obviously the flipping. Mm -hmm. And we get to see like how he is after this. All of these events have transpired and he's like hamming it up big time. But the way that he like he's got that Jack Sparrow, like loosey goosey yeah. kind of thing going on. So this movie like. I, I had a I had a fun time with it, right? Like it, Johnny Depp's hamming it up. Um, you know, it's it's cool seeing something I just read come to life. Always mm -hmm. fun. But overall, like I I was pretty underwhelmed with the result of like I, I didn't love this movie. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing yeah. it when it came out, like you said, and I and I liked it when it came out. Um, so I thought I was gonna like it more than I did this time. But I think something about the execution of the twist and the changes that were made rub me the wrong way. I didn't love the casting. Like, I love John uh, Turturro, but mm -hmm. I did not like him as Shooter. I, I really, like, I was imagining the guy who um, plays the drill sergeant in um, Full, Metal uh, Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. I thought it was him. <laughs> like, I, I I had a memory. I thought that was the guy who played him, and I was like, oh, that was a good casting. And then he it was John so Turturro. would have intimidating. And, yeah, and he yeah. was trying to do this accent, and it, I don't know about you, but it did not sound right to me. Like, there, he kept, it kept, like, cracking it, and, like, it, it would sound really weird. And I looked it up, and he's from, like, New York, and, like, <laughs> and he's trying to do this Mississippi accent, and it just, it wasn't very good. And um, I don't know, like, he wasn't as intimidating as the shooter was in, uh, in, in the book to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, I, it, this movie, like... It was fun, but like I, I ultimately didn't like it very much. So hopefully, I'm not <laughs> raining on anybody's parade here. <laughs> no, for me, it was kind of just like it was pretty average. I would say like it wasn't yeah. like aggressively bad. It wasn't like um really shockingly good. Um, I think a lot of it came down to the fact that it it just felt kind of similar to other movies of the time where it's like uh, 
let's make like a mid-budget horror film with Johnny Depp starring and, and we'll make we'll figure it out from there. And it felt like there, yeah, there was some cool cinem- cinematography at play, but most of it was Johnny Depp performing, mm-hmm. and I think he did a pretty good job. Uh, I, I just think that there wasn't any, there wasn't that special spark that I think would would have made this movie like incredible. There wasn't like the attention to detail and like a The Shining, like Kubrickian detail, or you know, um, yeah, you know, the things that that make some of these movies really stand out. But then again, it was. I had a good time with it. I enjoyed it. I wasn't like hating it. I wasn't like having to slog through it. So overall, I would just say it was, I was okay with it. It was fine. Yeah. And I thought like the short story definitely, you know, isn't King's best writing either. So I, you know, it's not coming from, I mean, the story was good, (laughs) but I felt like they were sort of comparable. I mean, we'll get to the ending, which is the biggest change. But as far as the movie, like... I feel like my enjoyment level was pretty similar to my enjoyment level reading the book because I had fun with both of them. Is it like the best thriller ever? <laughs> no. And yeah, it rides or it rests on Johnny Depp's shoulders and because he's the main person. And But I love Johnny Depp. Like, I feel yeah, like I'm just yeah. such a sucker for anything he's in. I feel like we have to address the fact that like this, there's like a case currently going on with between him and amber heard like oh uh, yeah and, and it's like i still am so conflicted about all of this because i don't have enough details i don't know what to believe yeah. and i'm and i from what i understand it's sounding more and more like he was abused and that's like but the, i can't tell if that's coming from his fans or if that's factual mm-hmm. and it's like yeah. this weird in between period right now and i couldn't help but think about it because he's like in the news currently and we're watching yeah. a movie that he's in um but yeah i hope it gets sorted out and we figure out the the truth of it all yeah, it just there, seems so messy and sad. I think part of my problem with this movie is the the tone that it's trying to strike because it is trying to be so sort of funny and tongue-in-cheek at times, yet we're dealing with a man murdering his ex-wife and in a pr- pretty brutal sequence, he's not a especially likable person throughout. And I, I don't know, like... It, 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 it feels like it has a very dark ending and it attempted a very dark ending, yet mm-hmm. it's trying to infuse it with humor, which I guess if that works for you, then the, the ending can land. But I felt like the ending is really where it lost me. Um, I kind of couldn't believe they were they were going for it um, because it <laughs> you did, know what? It, especially after reading the story, it was like it ends very differently in, in Stephen <laughs> King's story because I think he realized that he couldn't do what they did in the film and have it still land because his tone is a little different. It's not as it's not as comedic. No. And, and in fact, it gets more into the like psyche of an author who is mm-hmm. sort of losing his mind and, and caught up in, it seemed like a little bit of like fear of, of his own success and fear of his fans too. And like how that kind of gets, gets uh, into everything. So I, I just felt like there was more layers to it to unpack. Whereas the, the movie was a lot more shallow in a way. To compare it to another adaptation by King that we've seen, I felt like the tone was a little bit more comedic than like a pet cemetery uh, in terms of the, the adaptations themselves. I think it's part of pet cemetery is like reveling the, in the original or the, the original one. pet cemetery adaptation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is like reveling in how it's a creepy movie. And I think that this movie wanted to do like, Oh, it's a creepy, weird, fun movie too. But when you have like a, a, f- a husband murdering an ex-wife, like it's not as fun and spooky as like, things being brought back from the dead yeah. animals and things like that so and there are there are harrowing parts of of that movie too like pets dying and and how tragic and heartbreaking that can be and there are tragic and heartbreaking parts about this story but something about the tone felt similar to me uh hmm. in this movie yeah i haven't seen pet cemetery so. <laughs> <laughs> um i i did just want to so there's a couple things too that i think where I'm at now rubbed me the wrong way and some of it's present in the book but some of it I felt like was worse in the movie and that's using mental illness as a sort of big bad in your story mm. and as, as like kind of the monster is pretty problematic um, and for people who actually do have you know schizophrenia or different kinds of mental illness that they actually struggle with a movie like this could be pretty harmful and I felt like King did a better job with that because of the way he sort of at the end cat uh, you know like characterized what actually mm-hmm. happened away from the mental illness side of it whereas the movie is just like yeah it's schizophrenia and this is how it played out um and then after he commits the murders he seems like cured and happy and that was really weird like i i didn't buy the whole thing at the end with his new persona 
Um, do we want to like go down the maybe like lay out the different ways these play out for people in case they don't remember? Yeah. <laughs> so to get into John Shooter, we already talked about how he was much more intimidating in the book. And then some changes with that are in the book. Moore did not contact the police. And he had this attitude of like, I'm going to deal with this myself. And he did not want to call anyone. He called his friends, actually. But he wanted to handle it himself. And he definitely made a point to reiterate that a few times. And in the movie, he does go to the sheriff, though. But the sheriff is this old guy. And he, like, didn't seem to care. And he's, like, knitting. (laughs) So that was another scene that seemed more comedic, where the sheriff is not taking him seriously. Oh, which follows the brutal murdering of a dog, which like, yeah. it, uh, it's, a, it's a cat in the book, which is yeah. also horrible, but yeah. like, I'm a big dog lover. I have multiple dogs. So like that, I was like, oh, please don't, please don't. And then they did. And then the way that that's handled, yeah, they like, in shrugged off and in, in, in the, in the sheriff's like, is it even a crime? And it's like, yeah, okay, it's just your dog. <laughs> he like, goes inside like, and just locks himself inside and he's fine after that. He's like, I'll get you for this. And then he's fine. And I'm like, dude, I, yeah would be devastated <laughs> you, can't just, yeah. you can't just brush this off and they made that dog cute too they made yeah. sure to like give it scenes early on yeah a lot of personality to that old dog <laughs> whenever you're watching like a thriller or a scary movie and there's a pet like you always know like it's gonna die like i don't it know sucks. a movie where it doesn't you're yeah. worried <laughs> yeah i don't know there's like whole websites devoted to like does the dog die i think is like a website <laughs> and you can you yeah. can find out for different movies whether or not you even want to watch it based off of that. (laughs) Right. And then another important scene is that one of his confrontations with Shooter take place. They're out like on this back road by the lake and a guy named Tom drives by and he waves at both of them and they wave back. And so when Mort is calling another friend in town, I forget his name, he's like, you know, call Tom because Tom saw me with this guy so he can tell you what he looks like. And so the guy, he gets back to Mort and he's like, you know, I talked to Tom and he was just being really weird about it. He said you were alone, but then it seemed like there was more to it. And so he and Mort decide that they're going to go talk to Tom in person the next day. Mort goes there and he, you know, they don't show up. And then he later finds them dead in their car because Shooter has killed them and he has framed Mort for their deaths. One difference, which, yeah, all of these are smaller differences, but in the movie, Mort, like he pushes the car over the edge Whereas in the book, he doesn't do that. But I did think it was funny. The book, the movie includes two details from the book where he finds the bodies and then he looks up and he sees a squirrel that's like... (laughs) I couldn't believe that squirrel made it into the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, He has like a stare down with a squirrel and then he passes out. And then when he wakes up, his leg is asleep. And so he's trying to like get away from Shooter with his like leg dragging. So I thought I liked that they included those two random details, especially the squirrel. (laughs) And so again, specific, it seemed like yeah. one of those comedic moments because yeah. that's very specific. I, I don't really understand why it made it. Yeah. I did want to mention that uh, the, the I think the part where Tom drives by and then we get the information about you, he was alone that I think in the book, that's when I was sure that mm. that he he was also shooter. They they make a point of him losing his watch in mm-hmm. the car, mm-hmm. but that's never followed up. So I guess we're just supposed to think that this is maybe how they're going to catch him eventually Mm -hmm. i feel like this is in the day and age of alternate endings like like oh this horror movie also you you know you got to check the deleted scenes because there's an alternate ending maybe where he gets caught or like this actually did have an alternate uh, not an alternate end but like a different ending where they filmed an additional part that they didn't include in the release there you go yeah uh should i reveal what it is it's not it doesn't change anything but basically like you know how like the camera's dropping down through the corn and then Mm -hmm. you get to the ground and then we see the the scene of Johnny Depp taking the bite of the corn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Apparently there was a moment where you saw the decomposing bodies of the uh, two people he killed, like in the roots of the corn. But I guess they cut it out because they thought it was too dark or something. This is a PG-13 movie, which is rare for a Stephen King adaptation. Yeah. And I'm sure that you guys saw, this was one of the only things that I saw about the movie was that the teeth that were biting that ear of corn. Did you see this? It yeah. was That was the Stephen King cameo. Oh, was it? (laughs) Yeah, that was his teeth biting into the corn at the end. That's funny. Yeah, in the book, I did like, you know, like King isn't very subtle as he's dropping these hints, for example. So in the movie, Mort's story is called Secret Window, Secret Garden. But in the book, it's switched. And his his story is called Sewing Season and Shooter's is Secret Window, Secret Garden. And then he goes back to his house where he's thinking about their house and he's remembering how Amy said that phrase, secret window, secret garden. And he's like, wait, Amy said that? Like, that must just be a coincidence. 
And then you have Shooter who says the word pilgrim, and then his agent uses that word too. And then uh, Ted, who he really dislikes, has a Southern accent as well as Shooter. So I did enjoy like all these little hints that were given that show you how he created this guy in his mind. Yeah, and, and I think King is leaning on his reputation as a, an author who uses a lot of supernatural things in mm -hmm. his stories. Because the guy keeps going, like, is something supernatural happening? And normally I would discount that, but I know I'm reading a Stephen King book, so I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe. Maybe <laughs> this is, like, a you know, some sort of weird monster that is, like, able to manipulate reality. And, like, so I think his own reputation leads you, like, doesn't make you buy into the idea that he is Shooter immediately. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're willing to grant the opportunity for some sort of, some sort of creature that just, you know, is magical. Yeah, and then that leads us to the magazine, which leads to the reveal, because he gets this magazine to show Shooter, because the magazine was published before Shooter claims he wrote it, and he gets it in the mail, and he opens it up, and he sees that the story has been cut out. And he's like, Shooter got to it before me, he cut the story out. And then to focus just on the movie, as far as his split personality goes, he is thinking how Shooter did this, but then we have a voiceover of his internal di dialogue being like, you know, how could Shooter have done this, though? That doesn't make sense. And then from there we go inside and we have two Johnny Depps as, like, his alter ego. And I thought that was great. I thought it was a cool was way fun. to do it. <laughs> yeah. I think I know where the Spider-Man reference... I was wondering <laughs> yeah. what Spider-Man reference you were talking about, and now it just clicked yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah, when Willem <laughs> Dafoe is talking to his alter ego in the mirror, and then yep. this scene reminded me of that scene so much which both yeah. of them like i love that part in spider-man and yeah, i loved it here yeah, <laughs> yeah. i thought i thought it was awesome and like you you got to admit like as much as johnny depp was it was the you know the movie was so focused on him like he has the acting chops to carry mm -hmm. this kind of role like he he can he can do the serious like when we there's the shot of him when um his ex-wife shows up and he's like basically flipped into shooter and mm -hmm. he's got like his his hat like covering his eyes mostly like yeah. i'm like damn johnny depp is he's like believable as this like crazy killer now mm -hmm. and um I, I feel like he also can carry the more delicate moments and he can he can split switch between characters pretty quickly and mm -hmm. like the believability and like even the physicality of how he's like speaking confidence yeah. changes and stuff so I, I thought he did pretty good here, and like he's the, that's one of those a actor things that like you you can't discount when you think about like putting a movie on someone's shoulders. Like Johnny Depp yeah. can, can carry it. Yeah, I know Luke said you didn't find Mort very likable, but again, it could be because I'm a Johnny Depp fan. But I did think he created a likable, sympathetic character in those beginning parts, and him having to interact with his ex and her new guy, who she found he found them sleeping together, and now he has to be around this guy, and so. Like, I felt <laughs> bad for him. But yeah, and then when he becomes this alternate personality, I was buying into that as well. And so, yeah, I enjoyed all of that. I figured, <laughs> Luke, you would have you would have at least, like, related to so much of the writing stuff that he's, like, mm -hmm. got writer's block and this. And I, I mean, I don't know if you oh, yeah. had writer's block, but a lot of that kind of stuff, I was like, damn, I'm sure this is kind of real for Luke when he's watching this. He's like, fuck. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and I guess like that part of it, I do really like, I just, um, he has this attitude about his ex-wife that rubs me the wrong way because he, he keeps referring to her as if she is property mm -hmm. and has been stolen from him by Ted. Mm -hmm. And he continues to like, not treat her like a human being. And instead he's like mad at Ted for being a thief. And like, he just keeps referring to her as if she, he owned her in some way and it was taken from him. And like, that was the thing I think that was bothering me. And, and every time he said that, it, it, I was just like, this guy is, is you know, kind of an asshole. Uh, and, and then like his interactions with Ted, it was so clear that the movie wanted us to really hate Ted and be on his side. And I guess I'm just a contrarian enough to, to feel like, oh, you know, maybe uh, maybe Ted treats her better, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like clearly uh, this guy doesn't have the best attitude. Um, but yeah, you're right. All the all the writer stuff I, I liked, but I do think that came across better in the in the book, whereas mm -hmm. in the in the movie, it was like he was just kind of entitled. And he to me, like this is the characterization of authors that so many people have if they meet you, like they assume you're rich. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I feel like people have seen too many Stephen King, you know, <laughs> movies where the author is living in a mansion and they just think that like, as soon as you publish a book, you know, you're, you're living in a mansion. And it's like, <laughs> that is not how the industry works. That is so rare 
for authors to be that level of success. So I, I don't know, like, and, and he, he just was acting more like, like an entitled movie star might act mm. than how most authors I know in real life are just nowhere near like this entitled. So maybe, maybe some of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With Amy, though, one thing from the book that I liked was when he's thinking about Ted and he's like wondering about their relationship, basically. But I liked the way he thought of Amy at certain mo- points because he was like, you know, she and Ted must be serious and he must treat her well because she wouldn't be with like some loser and whatever. I should have highlighted it. But so I like that part in the book where he, yeah, it shows like he respects Amy and he knows that she's not like some idiot who's just going to get swept off her feet by some loser or something. Yeah. He, they have a really good conversation on the phone in the, in the book that I actually thought was like a really touching moment for a story that is, you know, pretty silly. <laughs> if you look at the premise, but yet he has this in-depth character conversation between mm-hmm. these these two people on the phone where they they trade blows and he says something about like you know we we and you know we should be done hurting each other because we've 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 done it enough now and like it, it's so true to life and like and it really it's just a shitty situation all around like nobody's coming out clean everybody's made mistakes and um, I just felt like that was handled better in the book, whereas in, in the movie it was like, yeah, he's made mistakes, but we're on Team Johnny Depp because he's <laughs> charismatic and makes make cracks jokes. And Ted's terrible, so when he dies at the end, we're supposed to be happy, I think? Like, I don't know. It was really weird. Like, I don't know that he deserved to die. <laughs> Um, yeah, and anyway. <laughs> so yeah, when Johnny Depp or when Moore becomes shooter, and then his wife drives up, drives up because she needs him to sign the papers, and then they have this chase. And yeah, when. Ted comes in because he had followed Amy and then he kills Ted and then he kills Amy. And I was so shocked (laughs) because that is not what happens in the book. Everything else up to that point plays out the same way, like stabbing through the leg and chasing her around the house. Like that's all right out of the book. I was just so shocked. (laughs) I did not see that coming at all. But did what do you guys think about the movie, how it kind of incorporates the ending from, you know, sewing season or secret window, whatever the short story is called. The movie Secret Window becomes the ending from that short story. Did you like that they incorporated that sort of? Well, so I thought it was really funny because as I talked about, King has an interesting relationship with endings. And then this, like Johnny Depp was talking about endings a lot at the end of this movie, like his Mm -hmm. character was. And the way that the filmmakers were like, this is a, it's a, it's a better ending. He kept saying it's a better (laughs) ending based on what Shooter was saying. And like, I was like, are the filmmakers saying they're writing a better ending than King? Are they like, what's this relationship with endings that that they're having here? And then to have it end as, like you said, the, the actual published work within this fictional universe was the ending. I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of like meta in a way, but yeah, I, I, I think I prefer King's ending still. But, you know, fun to play with it when you're when you're adapting someone's work and have it still technically it's still like pretty true to his original work because it's an ending that he wrote within a fictional Mm -hmm. universe. (laughs) And then with the book ending. So we have the same chase scene, except Ted does not follow her. And in the end, this insurance investigator shows up and he kills Mort. And then from there, we have an afterword, which honestly, the afterword, I wasn't a big fan of because it felt, I mean, when the insurance investigator is explaining why he showed up and why he thought Mort seemed fishy, it made me think of like some kind of murder mystery where at the end, the detective reveals how he put it all together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It it was kind of handholdy, right? Like it was trying to, he he understood way too much about what was going on in the mind of, I, I guess the Stephen King insert character. <laughs> like he, mm-hmm. he was privy to a lot of things that he wouldn't have no idea about. Yeah. And then we talk about returning back to the guy, Tom in the book, Amy says, you know, Tom had told someone else that when he drove by, he saw Mort by himself, but then he looked in the rear view mirror and he was with like a ghostly looking person. Right. And then Amy says that when she was cleaning out the cabin, she found a note with the hat saying like, uh, like, Mrs. I'm sorry for everything I've caused and I've got my story now, so I'll be going. And the note, I was like, what is, who even wrote the note? Like, I, I just didn't like the afterward, basically. The I manifestation it was of Shooter. <laughs> like, so was uh, it yeah. an actual <laughs> ghost or did his... Yeah. So Stephen King's <laughs> ending also has problems um, in a different way. But yeah, it, Stephen King, I feel like he realized that that he didn't want to go with the very expected, oh, he was just out of his mind, and this mm-hmm. was a, like, you know, a multiple personality situation. 
and that's the explanation. He was like, I got to put something a little more Stephen King in there. I got to make it a little more supernatural. So he instead had this idea of like a manifested character that, Mm -hmm. you know, he just thought about so hard that he came into existence and that character, I guess, infiltrated his mind and became like a multiple personality situation. Yeah. And then the idea is that even after he died, this character was still able to write this note, you know, I guess leave because it was it was kind of a ghost, kind of a there's like a was it a tulpa? There's this idea of like a of a supernatural being that if enough people believe in it, it becomes real. And I think he was playing with the idea of a tulpa here, even though it doesn't name it. Hmm. Yeah, I I did want to circle back to Amy being having shine having the shine because mm-hmm. and, and especially like I said in the movie it, it became even more clear to me that she was like she kept reiterating I you know how I am I get these I get these ideas that you're not doing well and she's like mm-hmm. I'm just checking in on you I keep calling and uh, you know it's cool to see like a shining reference in that way or just yeah. like greater universe Stephen King universe reference in that way. And there was a visual reference to The Shining, right? As she's going backwards down the stairs and he's walking down in front of her menacing her. Mm-hmm. I just immediately mm-hmm. thought of that scene in The Shining. Mm-hmm. Um, right. and I, I don't know if that was the filmmakers trying to reference it or if they're just picking up on like the fact that King writes this kind of scene a lot, which is, <laughs> you know, take for that for what you will, I, I mean, guess. <laughs> really, I feel like they'd almost be referencing Kubrick at that point, too, because the visual idea yeah. of him walking, like Jack Torrance walking down the stairs. like yeah. that, that's There's what mysterious writing that yeah. she's just she's just seen and is now horrified of her writer husband. Right, uh, writing it over. A lot of similarities over. there. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and also I like the part when they're talking about he's calling her and being like, "Oh, remember that story sewing season I wrote?" And she's like, "Oh, yeah, like I didn't like that one." And mm-hmm. just the idea of like which I'm sure Stephen King experiences this where people are like, "Like, where did you come up with that idea?" Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought that was another funny part where maybe he's experienced that where people are just like uh, yeah, I read your story. It was good. But like, how, where did you get that from? <laughs> um, and then also another Stephen King-esque type scene, I thought, was when like Mort has to go use the bathroom. And then while he's using the bathroom, someone calls. And so he gets up and he's like trying to pull his pants up. And he like didn't finish using the bathroom, but he gets interrupted. And he's like, I feel like everyone's experienced this, but it's never been written about in a book. Like, but yeah. it has now. Pat himself yeah. on the back <laughs> right yeah. there a little bit. <laughs> But I know, I think you guys have talked about how Stephen King will, like, write that extra bit, that extra detail yeah. that isn't really necessary. But so, yeah, that felt kind of like that moment. Absolutely. He he goes there. Like, he, he that's part of his appeal, I think, and that people yeah. lo- love that about him is that he will write the scene that people don't write. And I think he knows that. And, uh, yeah, it was it had gotten so meta at that point. I felt like he was congratulating himself on finding <laughs> yeah. a way to put this in this, in this book. And there's also a, a part where he, and maybe this is, Maybe this is not what he meant, but I took it this way. He talks about like the 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 rank smell of his own smell or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is this him like talking about how self indulgent a story like this could be perceived as? <laughs> 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 because it kind of it kind of took it that way. Yeah, um, it could work as a metaphor, I guess too. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then. To talk about the plagiarism aspect of this whole story. So in the movie, he had told Amy that there had been an incident in the past where he plagiarized someone's story and then they came after him and then he paid them off. And so that's referenced too lightly. But that right there is also very different from the book because in the book, like you said, he had submitted a story early on because he had this fellow student in college who was a better storyteller than he was. And he had a copy of this guy's story. And so it was after he graduated he kept being turned down and this magazine wasn't accepting his story. So he was just like, you know, I'll submit this one, like whatever. And then it got accepted. And then he was just like sick with fear that he was going to get caught and just dealing with this. But time passed and then he never did get caught. And so it became this suppressed memory that then, you know, uh, was personified in Shooter is finally being punished for this plagiarized story. And so yeah. I loved that part of the book and just yeah. how that would eat away at you with that, that guilt that he felt. It deals with the psychology of guilt and of, you know, the, this conflict between, like, the character that he's imagined uh, of, of this writer and the writer that he believes he is. It just, I don't know, it just plays out so much more interestingly in the novella. So if you like mm-hmm. this movie, I do recommend you read the novella because I think it's the better version. And then, and then like, I, I mean, we've spoiled the hell of it, but like the, <laughs> at the end, the wife lives and she mm-hmm. ultimately defeats the monster, which 
the, I think that happens in the majority of Stephen King's works. Mm -hmm. um, he tends to have the big bad get defeated by the good characters. Even though we don't realize it, it's revealed that our main character, whose point of view we're in for the entire time, is actually the big bad of the story. And we get this switch where all of a sudden we're in her point of view for the last little part of the of the story mm -hmm. and uh, she battles against the monster and wins. And mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty fun how he was able to do that little switch. And then that's completely changed in the movie where she lose, she just loses. She just dies to her yeah. husband, which yeah, it's very dark. And then they, they try and play it off like a joke. And I think that was some of the ending stuff too, where he was like, Oh, this ending's so much better, isn't it? And he's like, he's mm -hmm. gotten braces and he's acting so ridiculous. I think they were really hoping it would be just be kind of funny and that would that would gloss over the fact that it's actually a really dark ending. Was it weird to you guys that they didn't have enough evidence to get him? Like they were the co like what? Yeah, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have enough evidence to even pull him in for questioning like Well, he says we'll get you eventually and it's like, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> He didn't do a particularly good job of this. The bodies are right outside. In the, the cop was shown as being very incompetent, though, so maybe yeah. he yeah, will that's get true. away that with it. That is true, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess to get to the book first movie section, <laughs> I think, well, Luke, it's very obvious. I'm pretty obvious, yeah. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the book department. But, I, you know, don't let me sway you too much. At, there, there is a lot to go for this movie. It's got Johnny Depp in it, which is immediately a bonus, especially this time period. So much charisma. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it is funny. And I had a good time watching it. It's not like I had a bad time. I had a good time. Also, I know we talked about Johnny Depp, but I wanted to give a shout out to Timothy Hutton, who plays Ted. And his role here, it's not like he's a steen sealer or anything. But yeah. he was in Ordinary People. Have either of you seen that? He won an Oscar for his role in that one in the 80s. And I love that movie. So I have a soft spot for Timothy Hutton as well. And he's in another King adaptation called The Dark Half, which is also about a writer who has a split personality. Surprising. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. He's a also... writer with a, with a, with a mental problems and a, a, de a deep seated, you know, violence. Uh, yeah. That's something that I think uh, King is, is worried about. And, yeah, uh, we talked about that in our shining coverage. Like a lot of that comes out in that book, and, and his mm -hmm. own worries about his own capacity for violence. I think. Mm -hmm. And then James, which one did you like better? So I have to go with the story. Yeah, I think I even said as much early on. It just uh, the story. It took me on a ride that was familiar. It's a it's a Stephen King story. We've seen other versions of this like split personality, but it's his own version of it, and I think it's fun to see him get to play in all of those different. You know, each of his books are yeah usually horror um, or at least really high suspense, but they also have that like he likes to jump into different genres within there, and this was his chance to do that sort of like split personality. And I, I enjoyed it. I thought overall the characters were pretty well realized. And I don't think it's his finest work, but it is. It's for a, just a brief, short read for for King, especially. It's really well done, and uh, I think the film has a lot going for it. But I think there's a reason why a lot of people aren't talking, shouting this movie from the rooftops, and it's just that it's it's a serviceable adaptation of a of a pretty good story, like you said, Laura. It, it's like it's not like the source material is is something to write home about either. So it kind of fits within that, and so for the those reasons, I'm gonna take the story in this case. And with me, honestly, like before we, like when I, after I finished watching the movie and reading the book, I thought I liked the movie better. I think partly because the ending was such a shock that I mm -hmm. like, it stuck with me a bit more because I was like, wow, I can't believe they did that. But throughout talking with you guys, I think I've been reminded of certain things about the book that maybe I hadn't been focusing on quite as much. So I'm not a fan of the afterword. Like I said, I just think it over explained. But if you got rid of the afterword, I think I do like the book better, but yeah, I don't know. I had a lot of fun with this movie <laughs> and yeah. I thought it was clever and fun how they incorporated the short stories ending, the short story within the story as the ending yeah. of the movie. But yeah, I guess all of us agree that the book wins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fun to revisit King, you know, and then yeah. also to get Johnny, to get to talk about Johnny Depp overall, just a fun, fun project. Yeah. Which I know you guys have talked about Johnny Depp for Sleepy Hollow. I don't know if you've we did. done oh, yeah. any of his else, but but yeah, I covered him for What's Eating Gilbert Grape and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. So we're definitely yeah, going nice. to do Fear and Loathing at some point. I would love to point. hear you guys cover that because I yeah. that's one I used to semi autobiographical, love, but, right? For Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah, mm -hmm. I used to be a huge Hunter S. Thompson fan when I was younger, and so rereading it just. I don't know, it's just how I've changed through the years. But anyway, yeah. so I'd love to hear you guys cover that. 
But, and also speaking of your podcast, so do you guys want to let people know where else they can find you? Uh, sure. Yeah. We are on every major podcasting platform, Ink to Film. Um, that is T-O, not the number two, which for some reason a lot of people think the number two is in there. We're like too, too fast, too furious. Yeah, yeah we think like... Ink to Film. No, it's just Ink to Film, um, spelled normally. Um, and then uh, we do have a YouTube channel, although our we just kind of post our videos on there with like a static image. So, you know, we've done like one or two like video content and we might do more in the future. So we'd love to have you subscribe on there and, and pay attention to that um, if we do some more of that stuff like that. But yeah, you can find us on that. Oh, and on social media, we're at Ink to Film on Twitter instagram and on facebook um so we'd love to have you join uh, over there and chat with us yeah it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun yeah and i'm also a patreon for you guys and i enjoy oh, the yeah. bonus content i listened to the egg was your most recent one and so that oh, was yeah, really Eggie interesting Bear. to listen to i love hearing conversations about uh, the meaning of life which is the whole point of that story so i enjoyed listening to you guys talk about that one yeah we love that stuff <laughs> yeah and thank you for checking it out and supporting the, the patreon yeah. yeah. So yeah, I guess that wraps it up for today's episode on Secret Window. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Don't forget to subscribe and to like this video and to check out Ink to Film and subscribe to their channel. I will link to them down below. Thanks again for joining us today and I will see you next time. Bye. Bye.